Bom, olá, boa noite a todos. Hello und herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums. Mein Name ist Laura Teixeira. Ich begrüße Sie sehr, sehr herzlich zu unserer zehnten Veranstaltung der Reihe Tropical Underground hier bei dieser Lektion Film. Wir sind sehr, sehr froh, dass so viele gekommen sind, weil wir heute noch eine sehr besondere Veranstaltung vor uns haben. Und zwar, wir haben heute zu Gast äh, Steffen Denison, die aus Lied gekommen ist. Und wir werden nicht wie angekündigt Amulet de Todos von Roger Luis Gonzalez zeigen. Ähm, das ist eine langere Geschichte, die ich äh, irgendwann mal erzählen kann, aber wir haben den Film leider nicht gekriegt. Aber dafür zeigen wir Lilian M., Relatorio Confidencial von Carlos Reichenbach oder Carlon Reichenbach, wie er genannt ge gekannt ist in Brasilien. Und es wird sicherlich spannend und äh, die, den Vortrag von, von Stephanie Dennison äh, wird sich genauso ähm, da anpassen. Wir haben mit ihr natürlich besprochen, dass wir diese, diesen Film heute zeigen. Ähm, ich finde es besonders äh, spannend, dass wir den Film zeigen, obwohl es nicht im Programm war. Wir haben zwar andere Filme von Rogerius Gonzalez im Programm, haben wir ein paar schon gezeigt, werden wir noch äh, im Mai äh, Copacabana Mon Amour auch von Isgonzela zeigen. Und ähm, wir hatten ursprünglich keinen Film von Kalon Hashemba im Programm, deswegen ist äh, äh, eine besondere Gelegenheit gekommen, mit diesem Ausfall von den anderen Filmen den Film zu zeigen. Und ähm, deswegen äh, freuen wir uns auch sehr. Ähm, ich wollte ganz kurz ankündigen, äh, Sie kennen bestimmt schon den Ablauf des Abends. Äh, wir haben zuerst den Vortrag, dann eine kurze Pause, danach werden wir den Film zeigen und im Anschluss gibt es noch die Möglichkeit, Fragen ähm, zu stellen und äh, über den Film und über den Vortrag zu diskutieren. Also äh, wenn Sie noch so Lust und Kraft haben, ich äh, lade alle ein, auch äh, nach dem Film im Gespräch zu kommen. Und ähm, ich will nicht mehr so viel sagen. Wir haben so ein volles Programm noch vor uns bei Tropical Underground bis Juli. Besonders jetzt im Mai haben wir den Schwerpunkt oder einen, einen besonderen Moment mit der Tagung, das andere 68. Wir werden das ähm, am nächste Woche äh, stärker ähm, ankündigen können, aber das Programm steht schon online unter www.tropical-underground.de ähm, und die Tagung findet von 23. bis 25. Mai im Museum Angewandter Kunst hier nebenan statt. Wir sind alle schon ab jetzt äh, herzlich eingeladen und wir werden Elena Inés, äh, große Schauspielerin und auch Regisseurin des äh, Cinema Marginal, äh, zu Gast haben am 23. Mai, deswegen ähm, ja, schon äh, save the date für diese besonderen Veranstaltungen im Mai. Und wir haben noch ein sehr schönes Programm, was Sie alle äh, in diesem ähm, Flyer auch da draußen finden können von Tropical Underground und auf der Webseite. Das war schon von meiner Seite. Ich will nicht so viel äh, sagen, dass wir ähm, wirklich den äh, Vortrag ähm, hören wollen. Und deswegen vielen, vielen Dank fürs Kommen und bis später. Vielen Dank. So this is where we switch to English. Good evening from my side too. Uh, thanks, um, Laura, for uh, mentioning the, the conference, the international conference, which will be entitled The Other 68, uh, which runs from May 23rd through 25th in uh, the Museum Angewandte Kunst with two screenings here, uh, which is also free, like all, the, all of the Tropical Underground uh, programming. For tonight's evening, um, those of you who've been following the series know that the Cinema Marginal is a cinema that pushes boundaries, boundaries between art cinema and commercial genre cinema, between legitimate culture and underground culture, between representation and the non-representable. Soaking up elements of genre cinema, many of the films that have been shown and discussed here transform the reassuring patterns and, dare I say, pieties of genre cinema into something more disturbing and disquieting. Cinema Marginal partially came out of the commercial exploitation cinema and the popular drama and comedy films of the 1960s and early 1970s. The Boca do Lixo uh, area in Sao Paulo, Mouth of Garbage is the literal translation, Uh, was a production hub for these films, and the porno chanchada, the sex comedy, was among the most popular genres. And by the way, Boca do Lixo, uh, Stephanie's already referencing uh, that in her title with uh, um, the, um, uh, the term garbage aesthetics, uh, which uh, she will 
tell us more about. <clears throat> These films, particularly the Porno Sanchadas, uh, thrived uh, as the repression of the military regime after 1968 became more severe. Uh, the generals actually tried to use sex to distract audiences from politics. But some of the films of the cinema marginal turned the strategy on its head, particularly the films of uh, Ruggiero Scanzella and uh, Carlos Reichenbach. Tonight, we are going to see one such film, Lillian M. by Reichenbach from 1975, and we could not have chosen a better uh, speaker to introduce us to this film than tonight's guest, uh, Professor Stephanie Dennison. Originally from Northern Ireland, Stephanie uh, is a professor of Brazilian studies with a focus on cinema, uh, um, on Brazilian cinema and world cinema at the University of Leeds, and where she's also the co-founder and director of the Center for World Cinemas and Digital Cultures. She is the author and editor of no less than 11 books on Brazilian cinema, but also on world cinema and on the visual culture of the Brazilian Belle Epoque. Most importantly for tonight, she is one of the leading specialists on the porno chanchada genre and on gender, sex and cinematic representation in Brazilian and popular and countercultures uh, of the 1960s and 70s. As we found out when we invited Stephanie, who has traveled all over the world to lecture and teach. This is actually her first time ever in Germany. And I'm <laughs> I think that's quite an achievement, you know, like the kind of travel routes that you've seen to have avoided Germany successfully is, uh, is something. But uh, we, we're going to make sure it's not going to be your last time. Uh, we're very proud to have you here as our guest, and uh, we are quite sure that it won't be your last time either. Please welcome with me, Stephanie Dennis. Uh, you need your glasses. <laughs> Thank you very much um, indeed. That was a wonderful introduction. I don't think I've had such a good introduction uh, in a very long time. Normally when people introduce me when I'm going to be talking about porn and shashad is it's here's Steph, she works on porn. So it's quite <laughs> nice that you've contextualised that a little bit more for me. Um, uh, and thank you very much to Vincent, to Laura, to everyone who's been involved in bringing me over here. And yes, as you say, it's my first time, but I'm absolutely delighted to be here, especially in such a fantastic um, venue as this Film Institute with, a, with such a, a healthy number of people in the audience. Uh, I feel very spoilt. Um, uh, I don't live in the most cinephile city in the UK, so it's always nice to be able to speak to more than six people when I give a presentation. Um, Okay, I'm going to have to take my glasses off. I'm at that age where I'm kind of not quite short-sighted, not quite long-sighted, so I might need to, by the end of the talk, I might be standing a bit like this to read my script. Uh, anyway, okay, so let's get started then. The, the decade of the 1970s, which is obviously is our focus here today, produced one of the most buoyant periods in filmmaking in Brazil. After the commercial failure of the art house Cinema Novo, or New Cinema Movement of the 1960s, Brazilians once again began to frequent the cinemas, encouraged by cheaper cinema tickets, the state's involvement in domestic film production and distribution, and by a certain mainstreaming of sex, typified, for example, by Bruno Barreto's box office record-breaking Dona Flor e seus dois maridos, Dona Flor and her two husbands from 1976. But the impressive quantity of films being made and distributed in Brazil wasn't down to state sponsorship alone. And nor were viewers drawn only to mainstream softcore porn films. So São Paulo's red light district, the Boca do Lixo, that's been referenced already, the mouth of garbage, produced a large number of the films made in Brazil in the 70s and the 80s, moving from softcore to violent erotic thrillers to hardcore within the space of around 10 years. Perhaps unsurprisingly, little academic attention has been paid to the film production in the Boca until relatively recently, with the noted exception of both the lighter end of the softcore porn film market, or sex-positive forms of softcore, as Tanya Krzywinska has put it, um, the so-called porno chanchadas, which have become a staple on nostalgia-driven TV programming in Brazil, and the so-called cinema marginal, or underground film movement, made up of a group of film school graduates who turned to the Boca do Lixo both for work and for inspiration. Their films, as you probably know if you've been following the series, are often very violent, heavily censored, erotically charged, aesthetically experimental, in some cases highly politicised and always subversive. 
And I am particularly interested in those underground films produced within the Boko do Lixo, uh, just within the Boko do Lixo, uh, which sought a dialogue with the porno chanchada, including João uh, Calegaros, o pornógrafo, so it's the pornographer from 1970, uh, Rogério Gonzalez, A Mulher de Todos, the one we tried to film, tried to screen, Everybody's Woman from 1969, and Carlos Heichenbach, it's going to be a Brazilianized pronunciation of this German surname, uh, Lilian Amy, Relatório Confidencial, which I think is Confidential Report in its translation into English from 1975. It's the film that we'll be screening. I'm interested in considering the extent to which these underground filmmakers used both representations and discussions of sex and sexuality to challenge the ethos of the Brazilian dictatorship 1964 to 1984. Uh, what I intend to do uh, before we watch the film together then is provide a context for appreciating the film. Well, I hope that's what I'm going to do. Uh, a panorama, if you like, of popular film or a type of popular film in the 1970s with inevitably a focus on what I am particularly interested in as a researcher um, of the consumption of popular cinema in Brazil. This is what I'm particularly interested in. Um, if I could perhaps then begin with an explanation of some of the key terms um, as I read them, as I understand them. So, cinema marginal, boca do lixo, and porno chanchada. Um, okay, so in the late 1960s, Cinema Novo directors ostensibly sought new directions in what could be perceived as a move away from the precepts of the aesthetics of hunger. This is Glaube Horsch's um, manifesto from 1965, whereby he suggests that the appropriate way to represent the Brazilian nation would be uh, to place misery on the screen uh, and thereby through that process somehow um, uh, abandoning any kind of dialogue with the public, I guess. Uh, so as they moved more towards the public, a younger generation of cineasts, this time based in Sao Paulo, uh, challenged the hegemony of Cinema Novo in the realm of alternative cinema. So Cinema Marginal has been given a number of labels over the years, underground or Uji Gruji, um, in a deliberate mispronunciation of the English term, uh, probably in a reference to filmmakers' ambivalent relationship with American cinema. It's been referred to as experimental cinema, as we know from this series, cinema maldito sometimes, literally damned or cursed cinema. Um, and one label that I particularly like to work with is the cinema cafajeste, which is really difficult to translate. Uh, Calegado and uh, Heishenbach in particular, uh, this works uh, uh, as a, a description of, of their, their filmmaking early on uh, uh, within the movement. So cafajeste literally would be a scoundrel. No, os cafajestes was translated as um, scoundrels, I think, uh, in the English translation. So it's a, 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 it's more than naughty, something that's much stronger than that. So it's deliberately, it suggests being provocative, it suggests being uh, illicit. Uh, so it's those kinds of negative kind of associations, if you like, cinema cafajeste. Um, and there was a manifesto that was produced by Calegaro, the director of a pornography um, and backed up by Hashem back at the time, early on, in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, uh, whereby they said we, the subversion that was implied in Cinema Novo, we need to trans we need to uh, replace it with transgression. So the transgressive, I think, is something that, uh, that I'm particularly interested in looking at in these series of films, transgressive elements. Uh, the kind of transgression uh, that one would see, would have seen in the Tropicalia movement, for example. So if we move, slip over to a different type of visual culture, um, they very much accepted the proposition put forward by Elio Orchisica, and I think you're going to be seeing some of his Super 8 films as part of this, this um, Tropical Underground series. So the message here is be marginal. Marginal, marginal, of course, means so much more than marginal. I mean, it's marginal, marginal in the sense of your relationship with the law, but also with the state. Um, so it's that kind of idea, a seja eroi, so suggesting then that there's something positive to come out of, challenging um, formal ethos, etc. Ethos, is that a word? Tis now. Um, okay, so... Uh, described by Fernand Holmes, who has presented here, as I discovered, has presented as part of this series. I'm going to be quoting Fernand Holmes an awful lot. Um, described then as the bastard relative, still not quite of a stature of his cousin. So this is describing Cinema Marginal in relation to Cinema Novo. Cinema Marginal did not herald a definitive break with Cinema Novo, but rather a radicalisation of the original purpose of Cinema Novo. 
and Helms points to the prophetic nature of Gloria Hoche's Aesthetics of Hunger manifesto in relation to Cinema Marginal, with its references to the aesthetics of horror, violence, and the need for Cinema Nova to marginalise itself from commercial cinematic production. As Robert Stamp puts it, yet another name that's part of your series. This is super, isn't it? Um, and I quote, just as Cinema Novo decided to reach out for the audience, uh, the underground opted to slap that audience in its face. End of quote. So more on the relationship with the audience later, as this really is only one part of the picture, I would argue. Okay. So while Cinema Novo created a mythical universe made up of, impo of the impoverished interior, urban slums, lower class suburbs, fishing villages, dance halls, soccer stadia, uh, marginal cineasts dealt with drug abuse. It was a different type of marge understanding of the term marginal then. Drug abuse, promiscuity, lack of respect for traditional values, such as the family, property, professional development, and work, uh, uh, anti-work ethic, celebration of laziness, a lack of respect for normal behaviour manifested in scruffy attire, dirty appearance and slovenly way of walking, uh, a celebration of an alternative lifestyle and an empathy with traditionally marginalised groups such as Afro-Brazilians, homosexuals, indigenous populations and women. Again, these are uh, ideas from Fernal Holmes on the subject. I'll just move on to my next slide. The term Cinema Marginal itself appears to have been inspired by a film, A Margin, The Marge, literally, of 1967, directed by Oswaldo Candeias, with its literal portrayal of rubbish, Lishu, yep, uh, and marginalised characters, and it's drawing attention to the precariousness of its production methods. Uh, but it's regarded by Fernão Holmes as tangential to the movement, per se, because it isn't in any way kitsch and includes no citations and intertextual references. In other words, for Holmes, these are defining features of the movement. Okay, so perhaps hold that thought for when you come to view Lilian M. Uh, Paulo Emilio Salles Gomes, this is the, 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 one of the uh, most important film critics to emerge Brazil in the 20th century. He defined marginal cinema as lasting for only three years and consisting of only 20 films. While Fernand Holmes, in the most complete study of the movement, dates it from 1968 to 1973 and lists 56 films. Although he acknowledges that he doesn't intend the list to be exhaustive or limited to these dates, which is just as well, uh, since the film we'll be watching tonight, made in 1975, but for me, indisputably a cinema marginal film, in my opinion, anyway, falls outside Holmes's dates and therefore doesn't make his list. Which is interesting. What he does include, interestingly for me, is a film by cinema Nova filmmaker Globia Hoche. He includes Cancer from 1972 uh, and the films of Zedo Caixão. I always have to have an excuse to show some images of Zedo Caixão. So it's Coffin Joe. Who doesn't love Coffin Joe? Uh, this is one of our, our um, horror filmmakers from the similar kind of period. Um, and I've never been convinced, much as I love Coffin Joe and his films, I've never been convinced of his agency and his awareness uh, with regard to the spirit of the movement, Cinema Marginal. So I, I have trouble with his inclusion, um, if you like, in the corpus. Um, and Hosha, Glauber Hosha, seems out of place in the list, particularly if we consider this definition of the movement as provided by Paulo Emilio Salis Gomes. Uh, and here it is. This is his quote, a quotation. A heterogeneous conglomerate of nervous artists, the Lishu movement proposes an, uh, an anarchistic culture and tends to transform the populace into rabble, the colonised into trash. This degraded subworld, traversed by grotesque processions, condemned to the absurd, mutilated by crime, sex and exploitation, hopeless and fallacious, is, however, animated and redeemed by its inarticulate wrath. And that's from uh, the seminal essay by uh, Salis Gomez, uh, Cinema, A Trajectory Within Underdevelopment, which I recommend you read if you haven't before. Um, thinking about that quotation, a heterogeneous conglomerate of nervous artists. I could never imagine describing Glaube Hosha as a nervous artist. Uh, the Boko do Lixo, then, literally uh, the mouth of garbage, as we've, as we've established. It's a nice picture. 
refers to a block in downtown Sao Paulo in the Luz district uh, formed by the, the Rua do Triunfo, where that street meets Victoria. Uh, close to the Luz train station, and it, again, it's just an excuse to put up a pretty picture. It's an architectural wonder built by the British. Look at that. Um, I, all train stations were, it's the only reason why I'm saying, is it English and Scottish, as I'm always informed when I go to, it's not British, English and Scottish. Whenever any time I go to Sao Paulo, they remind me of this, that the, the Brits built the railroads. Um, it was fantastic, beautiful. Uh, and it has a close association with cinema. This particular neighbourhood has had a close association with cinema since the early 1920s, when film distributors in particular took offices there, given the, pro the close proximity to um, trains, the old coach station, to be able to transport films to the interior of the state and beyond. But it was particularly from the 1950s onwards that it gained the moniker Boca do Lixo and became associated with the more seedy side of life as erstwhile middle-class residents started to move out en masse and the neighbourhood was transformed into one of the city's red light districts. So by the, 19, by the late 1960s and 70s, the period I'm focusing on, it was very closely associated in a way that was Difficult to disambiguate the two things, uh, both filmmaking and prostitution. So the impact of this association can be seen in pretty much all the films that emerge from the Boca, regardless of whether they were softcore or later hardcore porn films. And its high point was 1972 to 1982, when on average 60 of the 90 or so films made in Brazil annually were products of the Boca do Lixo. Let's put a an image up that better perhaps captures the Felicia rather than the beautiful train station. So even though many of the films being produced in the Boca de Lixo were box office successes and did travel beyond the urban area of Sao Paulo, so perhaps we just need to bear this in mind when we're thinking about the idea of marginal cineasts uh, working outside of the state. We kind of get the impression that no one was seeing these films, but a lot of them were box office successes. Um, Filmmaking there was different uh, from mainstream Brazilian cinema in that it relied on private capital for its funding. In many instances, investors uh, were simultaneously the producers, distributors and exhibitors. Uh, and there's a very good reason then why it's sometimes referred to as the Brazilian Hollywood. So it is associated with being very tuned into popular tastes. And from the late 60s to the late 80s, which marks the period when it was active in film production, the Boca produced over 700 films. Remarkable. And by the mid 80s, um, over half of Brazil's impressive film production was, in fact, hardcore, hardcore porn. And this is the association that has stuck uh, when one thinks of the Boca do Lixo nowadays, one thinks of it as producing hardcore. And it's um, where the idea that Boca production is the scapegoat for national cinema, I think that was Fernand Holmes who, who said that, the scapegoat for national cinema, for its lack of success. Very often Boca do Lixo is blamed for that. Okay, let's jump into Porno Chanchada then. Got an image of Porno Chanchada. So the Porno Chanchadas then were Brazilian softcore sex comedies, this is according to my definition anyway, uh, with popular appeal that dominated local box offices in the 70s. And their name derives from the Chanchadas, comedy films inspired by the Brazilian music hall tradition, which enjoyed unrivaled commercial success from the 1930s to the end of the 1950s. Taking advantage of a gradual liberalisation of sexual codes, filmmakers churned out, I think it's fair to say, spicier versions of the same music hall style film uh, while opting for a trashy aesthetic. Okay? Uh, both were self-conscious choices on the part of producers purely for commercial reasons. Porno Chanchadas, like many sexploitation films from around the world, provoked moral outrage on their release, but they are now enjoyed, in the words of Leon Hunt, and I quote, within the quotation marks of ironic appropriation or the political amnesia of nostalgia, end of quote. The term porn of Shashada began to be used in the press around 1973, referring at first to what was deemed to be cheap and poor quality production aimed at popular segments of the, pop of the population. The label was and continues to be frequently applied to any film from the era with erotic appeal. Uh, and thus its application has, quite confusingly, not always been limited to popular comedies. 
And given that a large number of what we now term porno shadows were produced in the Boko do Lixu, the porno shachada is often confused uh, with this film production more broadly speaking. So sometimes any films, including cinema marginal films, coming out of the Boko do Lixu will, will be labelled porno shachadas. And the porno shachada rose in popularity in the 70s as a consequence of the introduction of generous compulsory screen quotas, which resulted in exhibition groups producing their own films, the outcome being cheap, mass-produced softcore porn films, or Brazil's quota quickies, if you like. Um, so the, the um, compulsory screen uh, quota in the early 1970s ranged from six, 69 days a year up to a really incredible 84 days a year when one was obliged to screen national product on, on screens in Brazil. So thus, like their counter counterparts in the US, Italy, Spain, Germany, and so on, sex exploiters took commercial advantage of a loosening in censorship and produced made-to-order uh, films in which, in the words of Eric Schaefer, everything took a back seat to the display of nudity and the mobilisation of sexual situations, end quote. Films were frequently sold to distributors on their highly suggestive titles and taglines alone. And as a result of a process of self-censorship, um, they rarely delivered on their promise of sex and included other strategic reactionary elements, such as a confirmation of Christian morality. Um, most porno has ended in marriage. A quick example then of a successful porno shashada produced in the Boko do Lixu around about the same time as Lilian Emi is A Super Femia, uh, starring former Miss Brazil, uh, Vera Fischer. In the film, a marketing Svengali is given a seemingly impossible task to sell the male contraceptive pill to a deeply suspicious male Brazilian public. He dreams up the idea of offering in a promotional prize draw a date with a so-called superwoman. Uh, in order to challenge the belief that such a pill would adversely affect men's libido. In the end, the marketing campaign is a flop, as the superwoman becomes pregnant with 100 children. The final scenes of the film are of the superfemia and her substantial brood parading down the streets of Sao Paulo to the sound of the 1970 Football World Cup anthem. So in this sense, the film negates the official line, if you like, because after all, Brazil's World Cup victory uh, in 1970 was seized upon by the military dictators as evidence of the success of the regime. And another very quick example, uh, just so you can see the development, the very rapid development of uh, a kind of a sex positive, cosy, if you like, um, image to something a little bit stronger, moving gradually into hardcore. Uh, Noite das Tares, a later porn of Shanshada, demonstrates, uh, as I say, this relatively rapid shift towards more hardcore content um, as censorship is loosened further towards the back end of the military regime. Seemingly a lone voice on uh, Brazil's critical landscape, José Carlos Avelar, as early as 1979, offered an alternative reading strategy for the porn of Shanshada recognising a carnivalesque defiance of the audience in the light of the dictatorship. His arguments are worth reproducing here, given the extent to which they capture the spirit of cinema marginal as well, I would argue. So he writes, and I quote, the spectator would go to the cinema to take part in a kind of plot to conspire against the established order, end of quote as depicted, for example, by the government's short uh, propaganda films that regularly preceded feature films at that time. So these government propaganda films or adverts for the state um, were often shot in soft focus. They'd have these smooth, paternalistic sounding voiceovers, echoing messages such as, meu Brasil, eu amo você, my Brazil, I love you. And they, they dealt with themes like hygiene, health, work, uh, and with the objective of improving living conditions and galvanising the workforce. Porno Chanchadas, on the other hand, were, according to José Carlos Avelar, bad-mannered, sluttish, utterly stupid, and they promoted individualism and a rejection of the work ethic. So the films became, for him, an unconscious act of revenge on the official publicity that depicted Brazil as a super nation. 
Um, so here are some clear, there are some clear overlaps here then with the, with the, the films that I'm interested in, and in particular Li Liang M that we'll be watching. Um, so the suggestive titles, okay, that's one thing. Should we go back and remind ourselves? Suggestive titles, the idea of transgression that's implied not only in the translate, in the, in the, um, in the titles, but also in the, in the, uh, diegesis. And the sexual subject matter. Okay. Uh, methods of production and distribution. Yeah. A shared audience, which is very important, I think. Okay. And when discussing this notion of transgression uh, and films with a sexual content produced during the dictatorship that offered a form of resistance, it's often to these kinds of films that critics and scholars turn. So these films, yeah, rather than the porn of Shadows themselves. So take, for example, the acclaimed and very con controversial UK documentary Brazil Cinema Sex and the Generals by Simon Hartog, which purported to examine the irony of the existence of a huge number of sexploitation films that were somehow sanctioned by the ultra-conservative military government in Brazil. Interestingly, the, docu the documentary doesn't cite a single porno chanchada, but it does discuss the films of Carlos Heichenbach. Okay, so back to Carlos then. Carlão, as we know, in Brazil, affectionately referred to, um, was born in the southernmost state of Rio Grande do Sul. Should we see an image of Carlão, if I can find one? Let's go back, see where he is. There he is, there, behind the camera. Born in the southernmost state of Rio Grande do Sul, hence the German surname. Southern states received a, a large influx of German immigrants from the late 19th century to the Second World War. Uh, but he moved to the city of, of Sao Paulo at a very early age, and from a very early age, he had contact with filmmakers through his father's connections. He was one of a select and influential group trained at the informal Escola Superior de Cinema São Luís, so São Luís um, uh, Cinema School, under the tutelage of filmmaker Luís Sérgio Persson, best known for the anti-city symphony film São Paulo Cidade Anónima. And it was there that he met intellectuals of the ilk of the previously mentioned film critic, Paulo Emilio Salles Gomes. And he also frequented the Sociedade Amigos da Cinemateca, so the Society of Friends of the Cinematheque, where he would devour issues of the seminal French film magazine Cahiers du Cinéma, and where he made a further list of enlightened contacts, so the film uh, critic Jairo Ferreira, for example. And with Jairo, he would frequent the film theatres of the Liberdade district in Sao Paulo that screened Japanese films, usually without subtitles. Uh, Liberdade at the time was home to Sao Paulo's large population of Japanese descent. And in fact, there are more people of Japanese descent living in Brazil than there are anywhere else outside of Japan. Japanese film, and in particular the 1960s New Wave films, were are often cited as a major influence on the generation of filmmakers from Sao Paulo, and particularly the work of Heisenberg. Like many other filmmakers of his generation, such as João Calegaro, who we've mentioned before, Heisenberg made commercials early in his career in order to learn the trade and finance his fiction film work. He made a couple of episodic films with others later associated with the Cinema Marginal. Again, João Calegaro is a name that keeps cropping up. And these, these films um, were described by José Mario Ortiz as deliberately reprehensible and anti-aesthetic. Heisenbach claims that he and Caligaro decided to make un filme sacana. So it's either cinema cafajeste or un filme sacana, a similar kind of, I guess, possible kind of way of translating it. So it's, a, it's dirty, sacana, it's cheeky, much stronger than naughty, yeah? Likely to, trouble, troublesome, likely to create problems, yeah? So he was wanting to make Mfumi Sakana precisely at a time when everyone else wanted to make political films. And this reminds me of a, a wonderful observation made by Nuno César Abreu in his equally wonderful book On the Boca do Lixo. And he said that filmmakers like Hashem Bak had to learn to negotiate with their head on the psychiatrist's couch the demands of the mass market and the militancy of resistance. That's the kind of period that we're talking about the early to the mid-1970s. And it was only afterwards that Heisenbach and others moved more closely to the Boca do Lixo and its engagement with popular taste. So those very early films, those episodic films that he was involved in, 
uh, shirked the idea of engaging with the audience. Um, and I say this to explain the idea proposed by Robert Stamm that marginal cinema shirked the responsibility of connecting with the audience um, and it only holds for, as I say, a small number of these early, early cinema marginal films. And in fact, a film like Red Light Bandit, which has screened as part of your series, uh, Bandit da Luz Vermelha, um, perhaps the most well-known of the cinema marginal films, directed in 1968 by José Ruscanz Erle, uh, for all its complexity and aesthetic difference, was relatively widely distributed and did well at the box office. So by the time Haishin Bak made Lilian M, uh, there was a kind of discipline at work, I would argue, in terms of meeting, at one level or another, the demands and tastes of the market. And it is the foregrounding of eroticism that speaks to the demand of the market in films like Lilian M. Okay. And A Mulher de Todos and O Pornografo. If you go back and look at all three. Okay. Uh, even at the level of titles. Uh, because of the foregrounding of eroticism in his work, he has often been considered a porn director. But the real goal of his intellectual por uh, pornography, according to Robert Stamm, is the critique of porn. And we also see this in O Pornografo by João Calegaro, for example. Uh, more wisdom then from Robert Stamm. And I quote, within Heisenbach's meta-pornography, eroticism is always distanced and voyeurism always short-circuited. Uh, when Heisenbach filmed Lilian M, it was under the self-confessed influence of two films in particular, the French new wave uh, filmmaker Jean-Luc Gondard's uh, Vive Sa Vie from 1962, and US exploitation filmmaker, where's my next sheet, all right, Where's it gone? Next page. Sam Fuller. Sam Fuller's The Naked Kiss from 1964. Um, and of course, could add to this, the Japanese films he will have watched in the Liberdaji neighbourhood. And it's likely since Japanese new wave filmmaker so, uh, Shohei Imamura is frequently mentioned as an influence, it's likely that a film like The Pornographers um, of 1966 will have been an inspiration also. The story of Lilian Amy then in the film is told in flashback. There's, I don't think there's any too many spoilers. Actually, there's probably loads of spoilers in this, but they might actually help in some kind of way. Uh, so there's told in flashback in confessional form. Lilian Amy has recorded um, on a Nagra tape recorder the tale of her experiences of living in Sao Paulo after fleeing her quiet life in the rural interior. And in fact, this is a very recognisable trope of uh, in 20th century popular Brazilian culture. A character from the country moves to the city in search of fulfilling some dream or other and is taken advantage of. It was frequently the source of humour in the Chanchadas, for example. Um, take the work of Amasio Mazaropi, who played the archetypal country bumpkin Jeca in a series of Sao Paulo based films in the 50s up to the early 80s. And in these popular films, the city is a space to be negotiated with trepidation. And arguably the success of such films with the, with the public stemmed in part from a shared experience of internal migration. 1940s to the 1970s was a time of mass movement of Brazilians from the interior to the, that way, from the interior to the coastal areas and in particular to the city of Sao Paulo. And with the shift of these films to what we refer to as porno chanchada, so when the chanchadas morphed into the porno chanchada, the central character frequently was a woman who's taken advantage of sexually because we need the titillation. Yeah, we need that in the script. Uh, but of course, she enjoys it because this is porno chanchada and then gets married off at the end. Now, in this film, Lilian Amy, let's have a look at our actress, Celia Olga. Uh, so she arrives in Sao Paulo full of ambitious dreams, but winds up as an object in the hands, and these are the words of uh, uh, Robert Stamm. In socially descending order, she ends up um, uh, being taken advantage of by an Italian businessman, a German industrialist. Again, these are tropes that do crop up quite a bit in popular um, cultural production in, in Brazil in the 20th century. His salesman's son, government bureaucrat, and a car mechanic. Uh, so nostalgic for rural life, she ultimately has little choice but to continue as a high-class urban prostitute. And again, uh, following on from Stam, 
This apparently linear story is told in multiple and seemingly contradictory styles. So while the female protagonist is treated in a realist style reminiscent of early cinema novo, the other characters are treated in a stylized and quasi caricatural manner. Uh, as Robert Stamm has argued, and I'm quoting, the mix of naturalism and stylization fractures the diegetic world, disturbing the conventions of sociological realism and unsettling the spectator looking for easy answers, end of quote. And if you've been watching the other films in this series, this won't be new to you, this kind of idea. And while there's no denying uh, that this film and The Pornographer and Everybody's Woman, the other two that I mentioned, um, owe their box office success in large part to fulfilling audiences' demands for titillation. It's the way that Lillian Emmy relates on a personal level um, to shifts and mores regarding female so sexuality. That's what makes it quite different from what is proposed in standard porno shadows, whereby female sexual liberation is, for the male characters, either great or emasculating, depending on how sexually confident those characters are, but it's also usually unproblematically good for the female characters. And I'm going to conclude here then and invite you to consider this issue in particular when you watch Lillian Oemi, Relatorio Confidencial. Thanks very much. And, and we already sort of already know that that you know how how it will end because it's told in a in a um, in a in a flashback yeah, uh, yeah. Of structure, mm -hmm. and I mean the 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 music at the end. Let's say it's not it's not ambiguous, but um, uh, what, what's interesting is is the incongruence of the music and and the imagery. I mean um, the way it's set up in the beginning. Uh, there is a moment where the Rachmaninoff first comes in, and then it comes back again at the ending, and it's completely incongruous. I mean, the the um, the, the the reunion of the couple is sort of overstated in a, in yeah. a highly, you know, almost sarcastic, yeah. not just ironic, sarcastic, melodramatic mode. Um, and the way he uses the music throughout the film, I think, mm -hmm. is really interesting in in that sense. Can you say something more about um, the music? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. Uh, the music is used as a, it's another kind of ironic reflection on what's being depicted. So it's an opportunity to think about it's those uncomfortable juxtapositions, but it's also incredibly kitsch, isn't it? Mm. I mean, that's that's one of the that that kitschness that uh, that Fernand Hamas insists on on being able to see for a film to qualify in his book as Cinema Marginal. Mm. Although that kitschness can be found in so many films from the 1970s, or late 60s into mm. the 1970s, you know, films associated with a later kind of tropicalist sort of movement. One of the things that I had never noticed, I have, I have to confess that I had never seen this film on a large screen before. I've only ever watched it on YouTube, and <laughs> it's quite a diff obviously quite a different um, experience when you watch it when you watch it in the cinema um it speaks to me really it's particularly i would say the last half of the film and the feature where you have um when she moves in with the guy the final guy and the the sister in terms of dialogue we need to talk about the dialogue yeah. definitely need to talk about the dialogue but it's it's a nelson it's like a nelson rodriguez so there's a, a brazilian film uh film playwright um, who's the most adapted playwright for the Brazilian screen um, whose films have been adapted from 1958 right up until the present day right. but there's a couple of films in particular made by Arnaldo Jabor who's a filmmaker who's kind of for me associated with tropicalist movement but he's sort of late cinema novo and was making films at exactly the same time one of his films in particular is so similar mm. but it's kind of like there it's one of those very many kind of intertextual references, right. again, which Fernand Hamas insists on seeing for a film to qualify as cinema mm. now. It's all there, but it's one of the Brazilian intertextual references, yeah. I would argue. Um, and those kinds of films were, music was used in a really naff, um, kind of kitsch kind of way, um, as, a, as an uncomfortable kind of juxtaposition with something that was supposedly serious. Yeah. So you have these supposedly dramatic moments that are that are debunked, if you like, by the music. Mm. So yeah, so it's just one of the many layers that reminds you that you shouldn't be taking this too, too seriously. But at the same time, you should look mm. out for the serious comments. There's comments on torture, 
yeah. um, that are very clear, and I don't know how they got past the censor, but they did because they weren't. I mean, you've, you're watching the uncut version, obviously, but there were five cuts to the film when it was first released. That the torture, those two torture scenes were in the original yeah. when it was screened, which is interesting too. They were coded as, as sexual perversion and, and probably made it past the censor that way, but. Um but, but it's true. Yeah, uh, but, but also they were being done in that. It was a German. It was a non-Brazilian character. Right, yeah. Was, yeah. So, yeah. so, so you couldn't, the idea is you can't possibly link this to what might or might not be going yeah. on during the dictatorship yeah. in the 1970s. Got to be a German thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, one way to describe it is, is, is uh, to describe it as sort of a double agent uh, aesthetics, you know, the the film works as a genre film. It it pulls all the the stops that that you need for a porno sort of film, but at the same time, it's an extremely sophisticated piece of filmmaking. You know, this is someone who knows film history well. Uh, this is someone who uh, clearly has an eye for getting good shots out of yeah. very, very yeah. limited yeah. resources. Yeah. I mean, like the, the 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 farewell scene with Gonsalves at, at the at the train station. You know, this is just some random suburban train station, and and just the visuals he gets out of this with the with the turning cross uh, um, is is amazing. Uh, the actress is amazing. The, uh, she totally carries the film. Uh, she's, you know, she, she has such range, and and you can use her almost like a Weimar cinema icon. But then she can also be a, 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 a Nouvelle Vague type of Gauss. Uh, so so the, the what she brings to the film, and and the way the director, um, uh, you know uses her in the mise-en-scene, I think, is, is very remarkable in terms of filmmaking. So it, it, it functions almost like, yeah. a, like a double text or like, a, yeah. I would say, a double agent mm -hmm. uh, type of enterprise. Yeah. I don't know what you're taking. No, definitely. This. I mean, presumably the other films that you've watched as part of this series, that at least some of those you'll have been left with a similar mm. impression, yeah. I would imagine. Yes, I mean that double text. Is Certainly, the early Gonzalez. Yes, there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's kind of again another feature mm. that we might say is sort of typical of the the the, the iconic cinema marginal films, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm interested. I think I said at the beginning of my talk something that I'm particularly interested in is uh, reception. Um, and, and audiences and how films fit in with popular tropes, etc. So it's the it's the, it's the other text, if you like, that I that 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 I tend to focus on. Um, and I guess the thing that if there's something that leaves me slightly uncomfortable about this film and other films is to what extent they were um, simply serving the purpose of a particular part of the audience, which is the element of titillation, because ultimately the vast majority of people who went to see this film when it was released in cinema halls were there for a particular reason, and it was to see any opportunity for something that was going to turn them on. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, it's. Uh, I, I get this idea of discipline, which I mentioned in mm -hmm. my talk, this idea that uh, if we want to, if we're going to work with the book and we're going to take, take um, experience, um, influence from the Boca do Lixo. We're going to uh, be partly funded, not in the case of this film. This was really um, Eisenbach's own money, ultimately, mm. mostly, that went into this film. But working within that kind of uh, milieu with actors, so Jairo Ferreira, his friend, yeah. crops up, etc., etc. Um, so that discipline is part of it. But the payoff would have to be an opportunity to really... Um, do something with the experimental side of mm. things but by d d um, demonstrating his knowledge of film history, for example, by educating. And I get frustrated because I don't feel that that necessarily was the case with these films when they were released. That um, they weren't seen that way? No, I mean, they would have been seen by a select, it would have been, you know, a select group mm. of individuals, probably, you know, the, who are part of the same Sociedade de Amigos do Cinema, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the same cinephile, very limited cinephile mm. groups. So in what way are we getting beyond the problems that the early cinema novel films had in finding an audience and finding a way to communicate, mm. you know, the, the, the important political kind of comments that are, you know, very sort of clear. For me, sitting watching the film, I can see them, but what was an audience... So did, w does it nullify, by actually speaking to that those kinds of commercial elements, does it nullify the the value of... 
And that's not trying to <laughs> sound incredibly negative, but it is, it's an issue that I do have with these kinds of films because I, because I, I'm looking so much at the, the, yeah. the audience and who the market and who the ultimate audience was and how they were consumed, my understanding of how these kinds of films were consumed, and the mm. experience of going to see films as early as I started going to see films in Brazil in the 1980s, so we're still in the period of hardcore, right. where you didn't go to the cinema by yourself. You really didn't. I mean, cinema halls, you know, in particularly in downtown areas, were places where you went to pick up prostitutes. Right. You know, until the late 1980s. So it's, it's that kind of context that I have in my head when I, mm -hmm. that I, yeah. But anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. Probably not. No, but I mean, <laughs> and to the extent that that you raised the question, um, uh, again, I think I think uh, that that's what I was trying to get at with the with the idea of a double agent yeah. aesthetics. You know, mm -hmm. depending on the constituency and the context, the film functions differently. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it works as a cinephile, as an exercise in cinephilia yeah. for a cinephile audience. Yes, yes, yes. It's uh, softcore porn, you know, to turn people on, those people on who are looking for it. But there's also a, a side of, of melodrama to it. I mean, I find the female character really interesting. And I think w one of my takeaways from the series is that I want to look at these films again and compare them to something like early Fossbender. Um, both in terms of the aesthetics and, 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 and the themes. And, um, you know, Seme Sarania is a film that's shot entirely in long takes. And Fossbinder at pretty much the same time, under very similar circumstances, right. made a very similar film. Warnung vor einer heiligen Nutte. So I'm interested in those those parallels. And, and uh, no, he was described as the tropical Fassbinder. Right, right. Did yeah, you know yeah, that? yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And, and so... Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, th th this this film in in, in particular uh, justifies that comparison, yeah. I think, yeah. just just through the female character and yeah, the, I mean, just that series of useless men. Uh, that yes, absolutely, <laughs> utterly. Um, I mean, I, I I just to go back to the point that you you made about you know how how um, Celia Olga is uh, is you know is filmed, and I mean, it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it it does stop you in your tracks occasionally, and you think, well, actually, yeah, I can see what's going on here, um, and it's very very much female focused as well in that sense that the, the, the clever stuff is saved for the women and you're right the men are expendable um, so you can extrapolate something quite interesting politically from from the, from that cho from those choices that he makes um, I've done more recently done some work on um, one of his much later films I think it was pen his penultimate film uh, Falsa Loda uh, which is fake blonde I think might be the translation it's either false blonde or fake blonde translation in um, English which is from in made in the 2000s where it's clear again having watched this on the big screen which makes all the difference it's very clear that the that some of that some of the um the passion you know that's obvious when he was actually filming and capturing um the Lilium has been transferred to this more more much more recent much more commercial mm -hmm. film in terms of um t uh, storytelling right um, also very much dealing with um, a, a, a woman um, who's marginalised in the sense that she comes from outside the, the centre of, uh, she's from the periphery of Sao Paulo, and how she tries to carve some kind of an existence and she ends up in prostitution. So it's actually a similar kind similar of a story, story, but a 21st century version perhaps yeah. of Lillian. Um, so so it's, I think he's a very interesting filmmaker in how he does that. And a lot of those influences, of course, are coming from people like Godard, people like the, the Japanese yeah. New Wave um, directors that he will have watched in terms of, of capturing uh, something psychological perhaps going on just through a look or an angle or whatever it might be. Uh, but the rest of it is nonsense. It's born in Shad, it's broken up, it's confusing, it's that... It's that uh, uh, dirty aesthetic that yeah. I talked about in the intro. You know, this r real focus on dirt, on uh, the grotesque, the carnivalesque inversions, etc. So it's very much coming from a Brazilian popular cultural right. tradition, as well as all these intertextual references to European and Japanese filmmakers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Dialogue. Tell us yes. about dialogue. Yeah, yes, Dial dialogue, absolutely. I mean, it's not. 
Because when I think about porno shadow, one might think, oh, this, is, this must be so much more experimental than your typical porno shadow films in terms of playing around with um, the absurd, um, playing around with different registers, because it's something that, unfortunately, the subtitles are good, but they don't capture the shifts in register that are taking place constantly throughout the film. And they're playing with a certain type of um, legalese and then some other characters are very much marked by speaking in a real slang. Um, and it's empty kind of rhetoric. Mm. And so much of the rhetoric, I mean, there were references there to, um, I think it was the, who was the one that was talking about the need for hygiene and keeping yourself healthy? I mean, all these kinds of ref mm. thinking to myself, gosh, I've been talking about these propaganda, you know, the right. short films that, that would have, you know, played before, often before main features. Thinking, I, again, I hadn't noticed that first time around. It's all there, you know, the, those kinds of playing with the empty rhetoric of a certain type of erudite Portuguese um, is there. And that's, again, as I say, lost inevitably in the... In the um, in the subtitle, in the, yeah, of course. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, in, in in that sense, again, I mean, that that that's something that that occurs throughout these films, like the, the yes. mim mimicking of official rhetoric. Yes, of, of, absolutely, of and it, you know, it's films. a popular like, kind of a trope as yes. well. I mean, it was in the music hall, it was in the traveling circus that predated the music hall, mm -hmm. the Teatro de Revista in Brazil. You can find it in other, you know, so there are other popular cultures that have that kind of playing around with it. But what I was going to say, and I, before I lost my train of thought. Uh, was in the porn, sh porn of Shadow, you also see this. You also see these ridiculous moments where characters suddenly start behaving in a very strange way. Mm. That's in a lot of the porn of Shadows as well. Mm. But, you know, so that kind of, we read this as something, you know, wacky and experimental and debunking and playing around and unsettling deliberately. Mm. But actually, that was a staple in a lot of the yeah. very successful commercial okay. films in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't, it might be unsettling for us to watch certain aspects of that now here. Mm. But actually in the 1970s in Brazil, that's, that's what films look like. Yeah. <laughs> the popular films look like that in many aspects. Yeah. I mean, so, sometimes, you know, pop, popular cinema is much more closer t to the avant-garde. I mean, the twenties avant garde of course, uh, were very strongly inspired by uh, slapstick comedy. But but I was also thinking of the fact that that Godard has always been a great Louis Louis de Funès fan, uh, and and always went to to the films when, when they first came out. And in the, in de Funès, you have the same kind of comedy element, yeah, you know, acceleration, yeah, and yes, incoherence, yeah. and all yeah. that kind of thing. So so, it's but it's not, that kind of um, it's a it's a it's a melding of the two kind of um, influences in a way that actually sit really very comfortably together. Those kinds of Godardian moments that you can spot mm. could easily be found in a porno chanchada produced and directed by someone who'd never seen a Godard film yeah, in his life. Absolutely. So. Yeah. No, but I mean, you can't, you can't derive a, a coherent modernist aesthetic from, from, from these films. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes, please, Danny. Um, the early scenes in the film seem to almost be a parody of earlier Cinema Novo films. I was wondering, is that a polemical uh, intention from Reichenbach? Um, or alternatively, a kind of fond, you know, yeah. homage? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm guessing when Robert Stamm talks about, when he describes the, the, the way that uh, Lilion is represented as being closer to Cinema Novo. I'm assuming he's, t maybe I'm assuming too much, but I'm assuming that he's taking that, and again, didn't spot it on watching it on uh, YouTube. Uh, he's taken that from the, the, when she first appears and you've got that grating sound, which is revisited in the film, mm. uh, which is Vida Secas, isn't it? It's Barren Lives and it's that irritating ox cart wheel, broken wheel sound that you get um, in a large part of that, which is very iconic. It's that very cinema novo. You will suffer while watching this film because people are suffering in Brazil, in the northeast of Brazil yeah. during the drought. You know, it's that, it's that kind of... But it's kind of like it's there and then it's let's move on. It's like, there's one of my intertextual references. And yeah, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was, uh, I mean, it, it, it's there and it's kind of marking her as being slightly different, isn't it? This is going to be the focus. And if, if you want to try and find something realist or neo-realist in this mishmash of a film, focus on the female character, which is what you're supposed to be doing, isn't it, with this film? So does that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, please. 
Um, yeah, maybe to come back to the question of um, nostalgia. Um, is that really the nostalgia, like a longing uh, to return to a more innocent and rural state? Um, or could it be also regarded as a nostalgia, as something prospective, as a sort of fantasy, um, as something which is yet to come, a, a, a wish for her, a fantasy of a different life, which of course for her never fulfills, right? <laughs> Because the last time she's in the countryside, she decides not to stay. And yeah, the second time, I would say it's almost like a nightmare, nightmare when this guy tries to sell her the piece of land. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when she leaves, the second time that she leaves, she leaves of her own accord. And I guess that's that, that's significant, isn't it, in the, in terms of the you know sort of the plot and on our understanding of her place in society. Um, nostalgia. When I was talking about nostalgia in my presentation, I was thinking more about the nostalgia of how these films are now watched. I guess, and I was thinking specifically of Porno Shanshada, to be honest. But um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, yeah, there's a kind of you're right. You could be thinking about the tip if the typical Porno Shanshada very often would be. You can't generalise, but let's have a go. Um, so it's a move from the rural to the city. That doesn't quite work out back to the rural. Um, and here you've got a, a different reading of the rural. And you're right, it's a, a nostalgic. She does want to get back to it, so, but she tries to get back to it by buying land, uh, by being, uh, by having some kind of agency, I guess, over, you know, sort of that. And that doesn't work out. So, yeah, you're right. I think it is a nostalgic. So that part of the rural life that's very often represented as idyllic in popular film in Brazil. Again, that's also debunked then in the film, isn't it? You're absolutely right, yeah. Which reminds me of the fact that when um, we screened um, Bandido da Andaluz Vermelha, uh, there was a, a young Brazilian man in the audience who, in the dis in in the discussion, basically just said, "Thanks for showing my favorite film." And by the way, the country is still as fucked up as in this film. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> are you, you're not going to do on that note, are you? No. <laughs> right, okay. um, no, I, I, I just find the, the the fact fascinating that these films now acquire sort of an afterlife or a second uh, a second life, and they seem to be speaking to whatever, you know, the projective nostalgia or uh, some, some kind of uh, reiteration of certain moments and elements of uh, uh, Brazilian history. I mean, what, what happened after the, after the, uh, the coup, <clears throat> I think we should call it that, is that, that a lot, of, uh, a lot of, the, of the gains that had been made since the 1980s were quickly abolished, you know. And now it's a it's a, once again a government that's all white and all male and uh, so in that sense we're we're back where these films started. Yeah, yeah. and they may very <coughs> well, as you say, they may very well gain yet another you know sort of set of readings mm. as people revisit them again and think of how they were made in what context they were made. Right. Made in a context of you know extreme. Um, well, I wouldn't say extreme, but complicated, complex censorship. Mm. You know, censorship of certain things, but not censorship of others, which actually makes it almost worse in a sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and just, you know, sort of the, the, this idea of these particular characters and in particular the way that they use language, because this was a big part of the coup, um, was particularly with the impeachment of Gilmore, was the use of illegalese. You know, this is lawfare that's been going on with the imprisonment of Lula, et cetera, et cetera. Regardless of what your political persuasion might be, you can see that language... Um, has been used as a weapon, yeah. um, uh, you know, in really quite complex <coughs> ways. So this film speaks to, uh, you mm -hmm. know, sort of to what is going on in, in the contemporary yeah. period. Um, and obviously this kind of very, very clear divisions between good and bad, evil, you know, good, evil, socialist, capitalist. Also, you know, we're back to similar kind of a manichaeistic understanding of the difference, you know, between those two mm -hmm. as depicted in a jocular kind of way in this film, mm. you know, with the baddie industrialists, the right. baddie foreigners, baddie men, yeah. yeah? No, I, think, I think your observation about, about dialogue and the different registers of language is, is really important because that in, in that context, these, these kinds of shifts are automatically and are always already a political statement because they point to the fact that 
language has become fungible and that, that there is no in a way no coherent mode of speaking that that will guarantee a social coherence or a cultural or political yeah. uh, coherence and and in that sense it's highly significant that yeah. that these uh, different registers of language come together in a, in the same film yeah. and, and in, in particular I think the use of empty really clever use of empty rhetoric mm -hmm. um, I think for those days 1970s where of course you know, with a dictatorship, if I'm right in remembering when I studied this in history, um, Congress only closed once over the course of the 20 years or 25 years, depending on how you read it, of the, of the period of dictatorship. Mm. So you had this, you know, false pretense of democracy. And again, perhaps we can think about the contemporary period when we think about these things. But a lot of it was based on, you know, you still have um, uh, politics going on, but it's empty because you have, you know, the someone who's ultimately going to win the elections and is going to be, you know, it's a facade of democracy, um, which, is, you know, is so linked to this idea of rhetoric and empty rhetoric, which I think is represented in a really interesting way by the chap um, who goes in for his massage. And he's the, the, but of course, it's debunked because his friend says, oh, God, he's such a bore. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like a no one's listening to him and he's talking for the sake of talking. I mean, this is this would have been Congress in action in the mm. 1970s. Right. OK, do we have any more questions? Okay. If not, thank you very much for, for a great talk and for, uh, for a wonderful debate. And uh, we will have you back. Very oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for staying so late and uh, yeah. watching the film. Yeah, we have, we have a committed audience here. <laughs> okay, thank you all for coming. Um, our next uh, screening is actually a week from now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We we'll don't have the usual one week break between the, the events this time. Next week, we already have our next uh, lecture here, 3rd of May. We'll be screening Triste Tropico from Arturo Omar. Uh, we'll have a lecture by Ivana Bentes, uh, who's coming from Brazil. And I hope to see you all there. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, right. for coming. Thank, Thank you. you.